Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome along this morning to the Football Insomniac podcast. I'm your host Colin Watt and it is my honour to be joined today um, by a, a kind of legend in the journalism business. Um, look, I've got him blushing. Some people know him as the Milk Tray Man, other people know him as Anthony Haggerty. Anthony, how are you doing this morning, mate? I'm very well. What an introduction that was. Yeah, yeah. I've the words a bit more carefully, but yeah. A, a journalist, possibly. Milk tray man, without a doubt. You know what I mean? So that's the <laughs> question. Uh, yeah. But thanks for having me on. Pleasure. Appreciate it. Oh, it's, it's great to have you on. And just as it is great to have everyone else who's joining us today. So if you're watching on Facebook, on Periscope, on Twitter, on YouTube, give us a like, subscribe to the channel. We are closing in now on 10,000 subscribers, which is an incredible number considering where we started at. Um, back in the summer of last year when we started going live um, and the content is free so all you have to do is click on the notifications um, and subscribe and you will get this content every week just like you are right now as I'm being joined by Anthony Haggerty and Anthony what a week in football it has been um, there's been so many stories going around um, I think though it would be a miss not to talk about one of the main talking points this week which is the death threats that have been received by Mike Dean following his decision to send off um, two players over the last couple of games that he's had. So the first one there was Jan Bednarak for Southampton, which we can all agree was a terrible decision in the 9 nothing drubbing by Manchester United. Um, it was definitely, I don't even know if it was a penalty, to be perfectly honest with you, never mind a red card. And then secondly, the red card to Thomas Suchek, the West Ham player, who was sent off for allegedly elbowing Alexander Mitrovic. Um, it looked very soft to me, and again, that one was overturned. Two red cards, two games overturned, and now it looks as if Mike won't be refereeing Premier League football this weekend, um, and he's had to report death threats to to the police. I mean, in your time of working in journalism, Anthony, that's that's probably one of the, the worst referee stories we've ever seen. Yeah. How sad is that, Colin, that, that it's come to this now, that fans think they can threaten the life of an official? Because they don't like the decision he's made. Seriously. I mean, you see if that's your bag, you really need to have a look at where your life is heading and, and what's going on. You know, because to err is human, I think is the phrase, isn't it? And referees will never get it right. You know, they, they do get it wrong. But you ask any fan of any club, they'll tell you referees are against them and they'll pull out a litany of decisions that have gone against them think that the referees are biased to a particular club would you be a referee it's just it's one of those jobs that you you wouldn't do it for love nor money because the abuse you get for a start and then if you try and open up and you you know you'd say why you gave the decision what you you witnessed at that particular time people don't believe you you know they, they question what team you supported before you got into refereeing you know and I just think that, see, when you're issuing death threats to referees, where's the game going? Really, where, where, where is the game going? You know, I, I know you can't, I know you get really bad decisions that infuriate fans, and I get that. And I think referees also have to be, there has to be some sort of accountability. And I agree with the fact that, see, if they've missed something or they've got something wrong and it's overturned via that process, then I think they should sit out for a couple of games. I think it's fine and it, and it allows them time to cool off, reflect on what happened, how can they be better? And I get all that, but death threats and referees, I mean, it's that's I, I just find that abhorrent. I don't know about you, Colin, but I find that abhorrent. I, I mean, the guy is literally doing his job. So to get death threats for doing your job, whether it be um, correctly or incorrectly, is a horrible thought. I mean, I can't imagine someone coming on here today and giving us death threats just because you've spiked your head up or someone said something that was wrong. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a horrible thought, but there's been a lot of this, um, the question's been raised by a number of pundits. Uh, and it, it's really, it's an interesting topic and it's something we will discuss in depth. A lot of Premier League referees are now coming out and saying, that they believe ex-professionals should be brought into the game and they should be fast-tracked in as referees because they have a greater understanding of what it's like to play the game, 
they understand about the sort of nuances with people maybe raising their arms or arms being in natural positions. Um, but when you look at it, in 2019, there was only one referee in England who had any experience of professional football, and he has now since retired. In Scotland, there is none. None of the players have played at a decent level. That tells you so much yeah. about Colin, doesn't it? You know, yep. you should, what's the first thing you should do when you, when you get guys coming to the end of their careers? They should be approaching them and saying, do you fancy being a referee? Because as you touched on there, who's the best equipped and qualified to referee a game of football? Ex-footballers. They've lived that life. They've been a player. They know the difference between intent, you know, and, and stuff like that. You know, intent and not and getting to hurt somebody or not getting to hurt somebody. They know the difference between a flail and elbow or a challenge, right? Because they've seen it, they've done it, they've been there, they've been that person. What a wealth of expertise you could dig into there if you say to players, right? You know, and I think currently at Scotland it's 800 quid for a match for a top yeah. of the right. So they would make, what, about 10 grand a year? But you have to make that more enticing then, if that's the case. You know, a lot of guys retire from professional football and they've not made a lot of money. You see, if you, if, if you made if you made an enticing proposition and a, an attractive financial package, you would get more guys thinking about it, more players. And you know what? You would also get you would also get respect from other players. You get respect from every other footballer yeah. on your part because they've played the game. And that's a that's a problem with a lot of footballers. They don't respect referees because they've not played the game. You know, you get somebody like Willie Collum, they see him as a, a schoolmaster, a, a head teacher. They don't respect that. Probably never respected mm -hmm. him at school. And I'm not picking on Willie Collum. I'm just saying that's his profession. Hey, Willie. <laughs> well, Willie, yeah, but he's always, always drama when Willie's involved, so maybe he is a good example. But he just don't respect law and order. But see if you've got a player, an ex-player, and regardless of what level he's played at, I think that there's a kind of professional code amongst players. If you've played at any level professionally, there's a respect there. There's a healthy respect. You know, and, and I think players would would like that. And you could probably have a banter with a referee as well. You know, a lot of players say yeah. they can't have a banter with a referee. They ask them why, and it's go away, go away, you know, that kind of stuff. I think ex-players would be like, be, the, the lines of communication would be more open with the ex-players. And I think it would be a so, brilliant thing for the game. I mean, if you take a look at it, so just taking a look at Steve Baines, who's the professional footballer who turned into a referee, um, he was a judge to have given a lower rate of yellow and red cards across his career compared to other referees. Now, that backs up the point that you've just made, that he understands more about the sort of playing aspect of the game. He knows yeah. when people are kind of bantering with each other when players are arguing with each other how to break it up and he, he's obviously gained that respect when you look at it a lot of yellow cards nowadays are given for things like dissent um even earlier this season we saw morton player robbie muirhead sent off because of the way that he reacted back to a referee um so there's a lot of that still happening in the game but you look you look at um mike dean as a, a professional he's now in his 21st year refereeing in the premier league now, if you've not gained respect for players after 21 years in the league, something's seriously wrong there. He's 52 years old, he's the oldest referee in the league, and he has had a list of previous incidents that have brought him to the public attention. Back in 2009, he was hit by a coin by Cardiff fans um, during the, the Wales derby when he was given a penalty to Swansea. And in 2015, 100,000 Arsenal fans signed a petition after the game against Chelsea where there was an incident between Diego Costa and Gabriel. Gabriel was sent off and that red card was overturned. I believe Diego Costa wasn't and on appeal was given a five-match ban. So <laughs> there's, it, he's not exactly someone who shies away from the attention and shies away from giving these big decisions. Um, but it does suggest to me that there is a lack of respect given towards the referees by the players nowadays. He's the most famous referee in England, Mike Dean, right? You say to somebody, name a referee in England, you would say Mike Dean. But you'd probably say, right, after, how, how do you know about Mike Dean? And you'd probably pick one of those instances that you said. No, because he's a great referee. He's just the one that's in the public eye the most because of various controversies that he's probably been involved in. You know, so, again, it's not a great look. And we're not picking on Mike Dean per se, but that's, that's how they become in the public eye when... 
decisions keep getting overturned. You know, and these are big things. You know, when a hundred thousand people are wanting, you know, that's that's a lot of people. You yep. know, seeing petitions and stuff. And I say, and it's it's kind of poor Mike Dean, but you know, re- refereeing's a tough job. I, I wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't want to do it. You know, but there are people but, that are qualified to do it, and that's players. You know, and you were talking about, you know, players would recognise things. Simulation as well. Players can spot that, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of referees can spot that. You know, off the bat, you know, there's, you, you look at uh, a Jetty's case that was thrown out, you know, mm-hmm. just yesterday. You know, Roof, Roof's case is going to be heard today, and then there's the argument about intent and stuff like that. But he's injured an opponent. Mm-hmm. A rash tackle. A Jetty has there's contact there. Might be minimal, might be soft, call it what you like, but there's contact there. So it gets thrown out for the very fact that you can clearly see there's an angle. So, you know, I think players, ex-players are, are more liable to spot that than referees because they're looking for it. They're looking for it and they can see it because they've, they've been that person, they've been in that movie. So I, I think uh, players have got an expert eye to cast on this and I would be all for ex-pros becoming referees. And I'm not having a go at Mike Dean or what I call him per se, but I just think that there's there's a real, and as you pointed out, that dissent's creeping back in. Because mm-hmm. players just don't respect the guys that are the man in the middle. You know, so I, I think in order to gain some respect back then, you maybe have to, to go on some kind of campaign to try and get ex-footballers to, be, to become referees and, and try and entice them in somehow. And it's obviously an issue that's going right across the game because FIFA used to have a mandatory age where referees had to retire because it allowed younger referees to come through. Um, but there isn't that element of younger referees coming through now. There isn't people that's wanting to step up to be the next Perigi Kalina um, or, in this instance, Mike Dean. Uh, it used to be 45. When they got to 45, they had to step away. They could continue to referee at their own league. Um, but they couldn't referee Champions League, they couldn't referee uh, Europa League, World Cups, etc. That had to get removed in 2016 because there isn't um, people coming through. There's not referees coming through the training. And taking a look at the training in particular, it can take anything up to 16 years for a referee to make Premier League level down south. Now that's, I mean, yes, you want them to be experienced, you want them to understand the game, but even if after 16 years, they're still going to make these mistakes. So what is the difference between someone who you know has understood the game, like an ex-professional, someone that's played the game for probably that period of time, being able to do this in the background, to have a career after football, where a lot of footballers at the minute, if they don't get a media job then and they don't get a coaching job, then some of them really struggle after this. Yeah, and I, I agree. I, I think if you've played that at a certain level, the fast-track system should come in, yeah? By virtue mm. of the fact that you've been involved in football, you have a grasp of it, you have an understanding, and you're taking it as read that they know the rules, or else they wouldn't have played a game where they didn't understand. Exactly. Right? But writing down rules in the exam form are a bit different from actually playing a playing a game, right? So they would have to pass some sort of test to just show they had a grasp of that. I would understand that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, 16 years is too long. People wouldn't want to spend 16 years. But say you could have a kind of a sliding scale. If you played like uh, League Two in Scotland, you would come in and at, at that level and referee, mm-hmm. referee those games. If you're yeah. fast tracking, you know, referee that level, you play that within a couple of years, you bounce up a, you know, and, and, and I say uh, an upwards or a downwards scale. If you were a Premiership player for most of your career, then after a period of whatever, you would go straight into you know, the fast track thing. It would take you to the, the Premiership games if they believed you could handle it. You know, so I, I would I would be all for that. But spending years learning your craft at you know, like junior level and, and whatever, I, I don't think it it serves some kind of purpose, maybe toughen you up to certain situations. But if you were a footballer, you'd probably be involved in all those situations regardless. So, yeah, the... I would say that the, the, that expertise was would far outweigh spending years in lower levels 
learning your trade. You know, because I think I, I think it's a trade you could pick up quickly if you've been a player. My yeah. Mind. But uh, I could be wrong. And it's something that happens across other sports. When you take a look at things, I mean, I'm a big ice hockey fan. You can see the ice hockey jersey behind me. Um, in the, the EIHL, which is the top league in the UK, some of the officials have played at a lesser level. They've maybe played at national level or they have played in the elite league. And then they go on and they can become fast tracked to become elite league referees. Um, you look at rugby, um, some of the most experienced referees in rugby, um, the, the boy that's the Welsh boy, his name's totally went off my head, but he's one of the most famous rugby referees. He played at a decent level before he started taking up refereeing. It was injuries that forced him into becoming a referee. Um, and you see it with boxing as well. A lot of ex-boxers go in to become referees too. So uh, I really do think there is an avenue for footballers to get into that as well. Um, yeah. And with the introduction of VAR, should that not make a referee's job even easier? <laughs> it was meant to make a referee's job even easier, wasn't it? That's the thing. Because you had the benefit of your own eyes and then other eyes. You know, but now we're splitting hairs over everything. You know, a guy's elbow, a guy's pinky, guy's left toe, you know, is, is offside and stuff, you know. So I think that's made uh, the introduction of VARs made referees' jobs even harder because now they're scared of getting it wrong. I, I think there's an element mm-hmm. here in referees now because they know that so many people are now watching. And then if they do make a rickets of it, VARs going to make them out to look a fool, you know. and and referees are always going to... I remember speaking to David Ellery once and I was doing some magazine piece and I asked him about the infamous Chesterfield goal. Remember the 1998 semi-final against Middlesbrough, FA Cup semi-final? Yep, yep. And Middlesbrough, uh, Chesterfield have scored. It's a goal that will take them into the FA Cup final. Boys had the ball, had a butt on the side of the bar, bounced over the line and came out. Ellery didn't see it and he runs towards his linesman and he says to him, go, and the linesman said, yeah. But he wasn't convinced, so he's running closer, and he says to him, is that a goal, 100%? And by the time he ran from, like, 30 yards away to, like, five yards away, the linesman was, I'm not sure. And he just said to him, well, he said it was a goal, and he went, I thought it went in. He said, look, I can't give this on think. I said, I need 100%. And the linesman couldn't give him 100%. And he said, no goal. And, and obviously the cameras proved that it was over the line. It was, yeah. Look, I gave a decision based on what I'd seen and based on what my, my assistant had seen, the linesman back then. Mm-hmm. And I felt, he said, he said he watched it back and he, he felt sick to the pit of his stomach that he'd robbed Chesterfield of a possible place in the FA Cup final. But he couldn't change it, you know? Mm-hmm. And VAR was brought in to make sure that these things didn't happen. And now I think referees are that scared to kind of commit to any major decisions that it, it was supposed to bail them out and help them, but it's it's been more of a hindrance because, you know, when Ellery made that decision, Chesterfield went mental, yeah, but they mm-hmm. got on the game. You know, they never stopped the game for time or perpetual motion. They got on with it. it yeah, and every club's been on the, vic- the victim of a, every team will tell they've been a victim of a poor decision like that. I think VAR stripped away that human element of it. And, mm-hmm. it's, and it's robotic now, you know, but it was meant to help. Sometimes it can be a hindrance because referees are reluctant to call anything now, you know, and they're going to right. rely on the screen and that's fair enough. It's up to them, isn't it, depending on how, what, the way you are as a referee. Yeah, and I think what we can all agree on, and I'm sure everyone in the comment section will agree, and I've seen some comments like that already, the standard of refereeing across football in general has been very, very poor, and I feel as though it's still declining. Um, So anything that we can do to improve the standard of refereeing, whether that be to bring in ex-professionals to help out with VAR, I'm sure that would be really appreciated. Um, And we're just going through some of the comments that's coming in. If you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook or on uh, Periscope, leave us a comment. Uh, We'll bring some of them up on the screen. Just what we're about to do here with John Boy. He's saying, Buena dia from Miami. (laughs) It's 6.05 in the morning. Uh, como estas, John Boy? Let us know how you're getting on. Um, <laughs> Owen McGrando's coming in saying, lol, I can imagine Anthony Stokes refereeing a Rangers game. I don't well, think he'd be allowed to do that, probably, given his history. Well, I brought up that point, and then you, you now you enter into the realms of who did they play for. 
uh, in their career and would they be allowed to referee that team then that's another question altogether isn't it you know so yep. I uh, but I think I agree with you I think the standard of refereeing in Scotland in particular is atrocious but it's always turned into a Celtic Rangers thing which it's not because yep. you've got Motherwell supporters Hibernian supporters Hearts supporters they all say the same things that the referees are hopeless and they'll give you a catalogue of refereeing decisions that have gone against them but why in this country is it always turned into a Celtic Rangers thing? Well, referees are biased towards either Celtic or Rangers. I, 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 this should be a collective. If all the clubs in the Scottish Premiership think, think the referees are poor, then they should get together and lobby the SFA and say, right, look, what are you going to do about it? Because the standard of refereeing is atrocious or it's poor or, yep. or it's whatever. It should not be turned into a two-club fight between the two biggest clubs in the country, because it's not that. You're trying to improve it for the betterment of every team. Exactly. The Celtic Rangers fans, you know, what do you want from referees? You just want them to ref the game. You don't want favours. You don't want a perceived bias, either left or right. You just want them to ref the game. They'll get it wrong sometimes. So be it. I don't, you know, and then it's the swings and roundabouts thing that people talk about and all that kind of stuff. But as I say, you go to Motherwell fans, Hibs fans, Hearts fans, they'll, they'll tell you they think that the referees are biased against their side. So if that's yep. the if that's the, the pervading nature and the most the uppermost thought of every club supporters, then surely every club should go to the SFA and say, right, as a collective, and say you need to do something about this because yeah, uh, the ref, the standard of refereeing is poor, you know, and it's uh, it's something. It's something I brought up when I was speaking to Ewan Boyle, who used to be the the social media manager at Morton Football Club. Um, there was a comment made about Bobby Madden potentially being a Morton fan. Um, and I think he he agreed with me. There's not many Morton fans that are Morton fans these days. <laughs> um, never mind Bobby Madden. Uh, but as all you're wanting to do, as one team in Scotland has said, is look for a level of consistency, whether that was irony or not. Um, it's the truth. You just want consistency across the game. Uh, Jungle Lion coming in saying, what's the difference between a season ticket holder doing a game or an ex-player? I mean, that's, that's a point. It used to be that you did have to kind of report who, um, if you had a season ticket at a club, who that was. And looking at Mike Dean, he's actually been stopped from doing some big Liverpool games because of that. Um, they reckon he was a Liverpool season ticket holder. Although, if you ask a lot of English fans, they'll say he favours Manchester United. Um, and the, the ex-professional that I was mentioning, Steve Baines, he played, I think it was over 100 games for Huddersfield, I'm sure it was. Um, and he wasn't allowed to referee Huddersfield games for that reason. So I'm sure there'd be a way to kind of uh, work around that. John Boy coming back in saying, eh, muy bien, amigos. Uh, we love a bit of Spanish flair on here. Um, but Anthony, you're going to make a point on the season ticket hold, I think. Yeah, I mean, you know, people have said that if you're going to get ex-players or, or whoever, then they have to declare which team they supported as a kid, right, or, or grown up, or if they had a season ticket. That's open to lying then, isn't it? Mm. You know, people could lie in a form. You know, I'm not saying they would, but they could. So, would we have a, a plethora of Patrick Thistle supporters not being able to do the Harry Rags games, you know what I mean? Because they support the alternative club in Glasgow, or maybe support one of the big two, but don't want to admit it. You know what I mean? So, uh, that's the problem when you you open this up to uh, ex-players and stuff, there's always going to be that, especially in, in Scotland. Ah, but who does he really support? You know? Mm -hmm. And you ask Motherwell fans, St. Johnston fans, our Broth fans, any other club out with Celtic Rangers, they hate that question. It's an insult. Who do you... Mm -hmm. You're an our Broth fan, but who do you really support? They hate it. They absolutely hate it. And, and quite rightly, they should. They should hate it. Because yep. because if you turn out to say to somebody, I support this club, then it's that's it. I've said before, I've said before in the Axon podcast, there is no right or wrong football team to support because it's your choice. Yep. It's your badge of honour. It it's what you carry for the rest of your life, right? You you pick a team and you go with it. Why, why in the west of Scotland is it a, a right or a wrong choice? It's not. Right, you're allowed to support who you want if you love football. Yep. 
you know, and, and I kind of get through my head this attitude that you have to be one or the other of the big two. Aberdeen fans abhor it, you know, because you can't yep. the tail less about the big two. Hearts and Hibs fans are the same. They're just like, yep. leave me alone, you know. So I think it's insulting to, you know, to any other supporter. So, and, I, and, I, and that's the problem when you when you open this up, if you brought in ex-players, people will still be looking for that agenda. Yeah, no, definitely. And uh, a couple of people coming in, in the comments saying there's maybe some teams that you shouldn't be following, but I'll leave that up to personal opinion. Um, but I like this point, and this is probably the last point we'll make on this from Hugh Anthony Riley coming in here saying, what I'd like to see is referees giving a performance interview after the game and explain why they came to a contentious decision. And I think if you do that, I mean, obviously it does open them up to a bit more abuse, but it also gives them the opportunity to explain their decisions and explain why they came to it. And although you might not agree with it, you can actually understand what was going through their head um, when they made that decision. And you can accept it, might not agree with it, but you can accept why they came to that decision. My thing with referees is, right, see when it's the most blatant ones and they don't act upon it, I would love them to explain to me what they're seeing at that time as opposed to what they're not seeing or vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. You can see a blatant elbow, right? But see if you don't deal with that, then uh, that's what support... They're the kind of decisions that drive supporters mental. What are you seeing at that moment in time? And I'm not picking out any specific incident or specific player, but I'm just talking about in general. If you see a flail and elbow, it's quite hard to not react to that, is it? No, I know. If you see somebody diving, you know, if you see somebody lashing out, you know, how, how, what, are, what, as a referee, what are you seeing? So they should be able to come out and explain that. And I never understood why they can't talk because, as you say, fans need an understanding. They need, they need a definitive, and you might not agree with it, but it's, it's one man's opinion at that particular time. And if you don't like it, so be it. But this is yep. how I arrived at this decision. It would clarify everything for everybody, managers, players, supporters, and you move on. But you get, yep. you know, you're still talking about incidents weeks after they happened. Yep. You know, and people, people will not move on. They're not allowed to move on. They don't want you to move on. You know, and it's, and it's you know, you're just like, oh, and there's two or three games have maybe been played. But you're still talking about this particular thing because it's it's not been dealt with in any shape or form, and I think that's yeah. what supporters go mental at, you know. And just to kind of wrap up this segment, I would say the abuse that Mike Dean has received and the death threats that he's received cannot be condemned. That is absolutely uh, sorry, cannot be condoned. They must be condemned. Um, that is absolutely shocking. I mean, the guy is doing his job. If he's got it wrong, he's got it wrong. It's been corrected since then. But I mean. It just it's appalling, and uh, it's I hope it's not something that exactly. It's exactly. A crime. If you, if you issue a death threat to somebody, you're committing a crime. You know, or it, or it should be criminal offence. You should you should be taken to task over and the book thrown at you. It's unacceptable in any society. You know, so in over what a game of football over a red card over over a man making a an error. You know, he without sin and all that, you know, so you, you have to question your choices in life if that's the stage that you're getting to, that football and refereeing decisions going against a club does that to you. There might be bigger issues with the person concerned, then you need to get to the root cause of that. But it's abhorrent and it's unacceptable. Exactly. And I think everyone can agree with that. So again, thank you to everyone who's joining us today on the Football Insomniac podcast. I'm delighted to be joined by Anthony Haggerty. We've actually been on for nearly half an hour about referees, but there's more topics for us to discuss um, today. Uh, and we only have just over an hour before the uh, Celtic State of Mind Bulletin comes on at half 12. We don't want to overrun into that. Um, but this is a very important topic, I believe. Um, and February is LGBTQ plus awareness month, history month. Um, and I saw a very interesting article uh, yesterday by Thomas Hitzelsberger, the former Aston Villa player, who is now the Chief Operating Officer of Football at Stuttgart. Um, and he actually came out as gay once he had retired from the game. Um, and it kind of asked, it kind of gave me the question, is there a, 
a barrier to stopping players from coming out whilst they're still playing. Taking a look at it, there's only three players um, who are actively playing um, sort of decent level of professional football who have came out. Um, we've got um, Andy Brennan, who plays in the A-League in Australia. Uh, Colin Martin, who plays in the USL, which is the league under the MLS. And Anton Heisen, who plays in the lower leagues of Sweden. They are the only three players who are actively playing who have came out. Now, if you take a look at the statistics in the UK, 2.2% of the population um, kind of are represented under the LGBTQ plus banner. Um, and if you compare that to the amount of people that are actively playing professional football, that would equate to 114 players um, who, going by that statistic, would be gay um, or bisexual. Um, and no one has came out. In July 2020, a Premier, a Premier League footballer actually wrote to Sky News via the Justin Fashionu um, Foundation saying that they weren't ready to come out yet because football wasn't ready for someone to come out yet. And the fact that we are now in 2021, and that is a scenario, it asks the question, what do we need to do as fans, as teams, as uh, clubs, to help these people live the life that they deserve to live? It's the saddest indictment in society that, that footballers in the UK don't feel ready to come out. The, you know, the gay footballer diary, Piece and, and also, I think he had a Twitter account as well. And I think yep. he, he ended it by saying, I thought I was strong, but I was wrong. You know, it tells you everything you need to know about the homophobic slurs that he got and the abuse and the virtual and the bile and the poison that was uh, sent his way for, you know, for admitting anonymously that he was a gay footballer. Why why should he be admit that anonymously? It's, it's a shame on society, it's an actual stain that you know, gay or LGBTQ uh, players can't come out. You know, Troy Deeney, the Watford skipper, reckoned that there was one in a uh, one in a one in a gay person in every team. He said, mm -hmm. "Right," and yet you've not heard of them. And I think that is, these statistics are shocking. You know, and there's other statistics as well that seven out of ten supporters had heard or witnessed homophobic songs in a stadium, right? Yep. Sixty percent of fans believe that uh, gay players won't come out because of that, because of the the backlash they would face from it. You know, Gareth Thomas, the rugby player, famously came out. Yep. And he was assaulted and abused and you know, and I think a, a newspaper even broke some news to his parents you know, about uh, something that was deeply personal to him. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I, I find it staggering and I find it sad. You know, and uh, as somebody said, the, the Rainbow Laces campaign and all that are, is brilliant. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yep. But you're not gay for a month. No. Right? And I thought, what a way to sum that up, you know. and But the, the more awareness you can have, you... You said to me that the Bohemians have a LGBTQ supporters club. Yep. I would take yep. that further, Colin, right? I would say, see every club who applies for a licence to play in any league, I think they should have an LGBTQ community within their club, or else mm -hmm. you would revoke the licence. You tell me you're doing everything to promote LGBTQ in your football club. Prove it. Mm-hmm in order to encourage the LGBT community to come to your football matches, as well as encourage possibly LGBTQ players to come out. Prove that, or else we'll have a look at your licence to actually play in a particular league. Might be a bit drastic, mm -hmm. but society's moved on. We, we have to move on. Football yep. has to move on, right, as a sport, you know, and if it can happen in other sports. But why is it that only, as you say, Three or four players in Britain have come out. Justin Fashion have been the most high profile. Why is it Thomas Hitzelsberger had to retire before he came out, you know, mm -hmm. and played in Britain? Why could he not come out when he played for Aston Villa? You know, so uh, it says everything about Britain as a society or UK as a society that gay players just refuse to come out 
And that, that takes its toll on them themselves because, you know, some of them have even got married and living a lie before such times where they feel confident and less pressure to come out and identify themselves as, as, as gay or part of the LGBTQ community, you know, and I, I think football really does need to try and address these things and what I said there about the licence would really make them think mm-hmm. about about that, you know, and prove that you're making dressing room environments safe for, and it, for I mean, LGBTQ uh, Yeah, players. and I mean, you know? see, see when you look at it, it's if you look at football as a whole, because this is a football podcast, it's not just male football. If you take a look at the female side of the game, yeah. you have the, the Scotland captain, Rachel, Rachel Corsi, who is open um, about her um, sexuality. She's in a relationship with another female. You take a look at the one of the world's biggest players um, in the women's game, Megan Rapinho, who I think she won the, the Ballon d'Or for women. Yeah. She's openly came out. Um, Casey Stoney, who was the former England captain, openly out um it, it's not it doesn't seem to be so much of an issue in the women's game but when you take it into the men's game yeah it, it's almost as if it's a taboo subject and we shouldn't be discussing it i mean it, i dealt as a journalist i dealt with leanne dempster who was uh who came out with her sexuality very early when she was a hibs ceo and the mother ceo and leanne dempster a great person you know so and but it was never an issue you know it was never an issue Whenever you you spoke to the Ann Dempster, you know, and she she's a wonderful lady, a brilliant sense of humour as well, and you know, and just it was it was a joy to deal with Ann Dempster, you know. But as you say, going back to the the male game, what what's the problem here? Why why can't any in twenty one years as a journalist, a football journalist in Scottish football, never came across one player who identified himself as a male a footballer. I mean, I've, I've started the record, what, 1999, left October 2019, so just, just over 20 odd years, and never once came across a player who was brave enough to say, I'm a gay footballer, I'm a male gay footballer. And I think uh, I think in, in terms of society moving on, then that, that says a lot. You know, I, I, I just find it, I just find it quite sad. You know, I... I I find it kind of, it's, you know, it's, it does leave a kind of, I don't know, it just makes you feel that uh, there are guys out there that, you know, that are hurting and they're maybe living a lie or they've got mental health issues and, you know, or, or issues re- regarding this. And, and this is another layer of, of stress that they, they don't need and just pressure that they maybe couldn't handle coming out and maybe don't want to be the first because it could if you're going to be the first you're going to trailblaze but you're going yeah. to you're going to you are sadly going to take a lot of abuse and you need to be made of strong strong and stern stuff to to kind of i don't know to cope with that you know and some yeah. you said that, that the gay footballer said that you know the, the fa said that they would give them counselling every step of the way. And he was like, look, I could go and get counselling any day of the week. It's not about that. You know, it's to protect me every bit down the line from everything mm-hmm. everything that would transpire if I out myself as a gay footballer, you know. And, and that's what you worry about as well. You worry about how Scottish football in general would react to that. I'd like to think they would uh, react with open arms, but I... I you know, maybe I'm just painting a a picture, you know, a kind of romantic picture of what I think <laughs> what I want it to be like, you know, for, for any person brave enough to come out and do that, you know? No, I think you're right. And if you take a look at this, the, the recent survey carried out by BBC Five Live, um, which was actually five years ago, um, they said 82% of supporters would um, support this. And I think even as times went on, I think that number would be higher. But there still will be people out there um, who see this as an issue. Um, and, look, everyone's entitled to their opinion, um, but you you can't then attack someone for having um, different views from your own, and you can't attack someone for having a different sexuality from your own, 
because that's just that's just wrong. I mean, it, it's annoyed me today that I've actually had to block someone in this channel who has came in and asked why we were promoting this subject. The fact that we have to promote this subject shows um, that we're not there as a country. We're not there as a sport. And it's, it's the reason why no one has come forward so far. Uh, the Raga 3 makes a great comment here. Um, it's because the Sun and the Daily Mail exist. They'd be crucified by the right-wing press, even if they were accepted by the fans. Um, and if you take a look at the Justin Fashion News situation, that is what happened. He came out, I think it was the Sun that he came out to, and from then onwards, his football career just took a complete nosedive. And eventually, um, he, he took his own life. Yeah. He, own life we really first. do have to support these people. Yeah, and, and to all intents and purposes, speaking to journalists who were around at that time, when Fashion had played for Airdrie, they said he was the loveliest man you could ever meet. He was just a real bubbly character and full of fun. You know, and as you mm -hmm. say, that's a tragic and sad waste of human life. You know, who was who was driven to to take his own life because he just, you know, circumstances, you know, and uh, surrounding his sexuality or his sexual orientation. You know, and I, I I just find that you know it's these are sad episodes, and have we and have we really moved on from that, Colin? That's the thing. You know, you and you see you're blocking somebody for saying why are we promoting this on a program today? Mm. Seriously, I mean, I, I, there are no words. How, how do you deal with that? You know, how how do you deal with that when you think you live in a decent society? And I yeah, think that's, and that with any gay footballer goes through his mind that if I come out. How am I going to be perceived? What What's it going to be like? And will my life flip upside down? And I think they, they wait up and think it's not worth the risk. And we've got a comment here uh, from Monty. It says, why did you block the poster then? You said everyone's entitled to their own opinion and then you block them. Yes, everyone is entitled to their own opinion. Just the same way that um, everyone's entitled to um, to say what they want to say. But when it gets to a level that you're starting to abuse people for their opinion um, or abuse people for what they believe in their sexuality. That's when things have to stop. This is the reason why people are not coming out. Um, this is the reason why we have a society um, where young people are committing suicide because they're too scared to come out. This has to be an open forum and we have to accept um, people for who they are. I don't care if my striker is gay if he's bisexual. If my striker scores 30 goals a season, that's all I care about. So for someone to come on and openly have a go at us for discussing this topic, that is the reason why they were blocked. So I just and want to clarify that. And also as well, it doesn't change anything. See if somebody comes out as a male footballer and identifies himself as gay, they're still a footballer. You know, you frame that narrative and then you end up calling them a gay footballer. They're not. They're a footballer. Mm -hmm. It just happens to be gay. Yeah, you can't start labelling the gay football or this, that, and the next thing, you know. So that that gets to me as well. The whole framing of that narrative, you know, it doesn't make them any less or any more of a footballer. They'll still be a footballer. It's like coming out. Yeah, it's like it's that's... like it's like it's like saying it's a footballer that likes Taylor Swift music. <laughs> we don't care about that. Or right. if they like John Bon Jovi, no one yeah. cares. Um, I just the, the whole kind of sensitivity and sensibility around the issues, you know. But uh, you would love to see it, but you just you you despair, you know, and and you just don't think it will happen. And then you and the concerns, the concerns is like with the World Cup. The World Cup now goes to Qatar next year, a country where it's illegal to be gay. You can be arrested and jailed um, for being gay. But it, they've made a big deal about the thing where it's okay, you can wave rainbow flags at the game, you won't be arrested for it. We shouldn't even have to discuss that. That should just be accepted. I mean, I, correct. It's a preposterous discussion, isn't it? It really is. It's absurd. It's almost absurd. You know, it, it, amongst all the, the issues that we had with Qatar, this one is a, a big one. It's huge. 
you know, mm-hmm. with the World Cup going to Qatar, and uh, this is what this is this actually will be one of the ones that will be, you know, it will be highly controversial because you know for a fact something is going to happen with regards to the waving of rainbow flags or whatever, you know. But I would love to see every country that's participating in the Qatar World Cup take some kind of stance before it or mm-hmm. make some kind of a statement, political or otherwise. I know they, they, they say you keep, keep it out of football, but I think that's, that, that would be the, the best way if they kind of unite and say, right, this is a country that, as you say, it's uh, illegal to be gay. We are not having that. You know, we are going to do something, you know, promote it on the jersey with the rainbow, mm-hmm. the rainbow laces, rainbow, you know, uh, symbols, rainbow, wh- whatever. You know, just to say, you know what, we're here, uh, but this is what we're saying. You know, and I'd love before it, if a player did come out before the World Cup and identify themselves as gay, I think that would be the biggest thing ever. And uh, before the before the World Cup, Qatar, how would they react to that? It would certainly be interesting. And um, to anyone who's watching right now, um, who is considering um, coming out, who is um, kind of not ready yet. There is a lot of support out there, especially even on this channel. Um, we have a, a podcast that goes out on a Monday morning, um, hosted by Rachel Estop. About the, it's called the Parenting Podcast, but they talk a lot about things like this, um, about coming out. If you're not comfortable, they can give you the right guidance, the right support. We even have Stevie Mullen at Rock Talk, um, and I'm sure people like that will be in your area, in your community. Reach out to them, and um, we, we hope that you get the strength and the courage to come forward over the next um, few months and years. So, uh, yeah, it's something that has to change in football and something we hope does happen in the near future. Um, but, Anthony, I always have guests on and there's always one question that, all, that I have to ask them all the time. Um, and it comes down to food. Um, as you can see, I'm quite a, I like my food, um, but I also like having friends around when it's allowed. Um, and I always ask the question, if you could have footballers to your house for a football dinner party, who would you have? So the scenario always is, it's four players from the world of football, uh, dead or alive, as I always say. We're bringing them back for 24 hours. It's like Cinderella, when the clock strikes 12, <laughs> they're, they're gone again. Um, but you've got them for 24 hours and they're coming round to the Haggerty household. First question, what are you cooking? Hey, oh, I'm a, I'm a steak and chips man. So, <laughs> pepper cod sauce, all that kind of gubbins eye, that's, they would uh, be well done, like, you know, but uh, whatever way they would do it. Whoa, 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 you're starting an <laughs> argument here. A <laughs> steak has to be cooked medium rare, not well yeah. done. <laughs> that's, 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 what the that's the Philistine in me, yeah, but, uh, yeah, so, we would be having that, certainly. Uh, but in terms of guests, do you want my guests? Do you want me to tell you, yeah, you... Yeah, you, you, you done through them. You kind of know them because it, it formed part of my five or side team that I told you the other day. Uh, yep. First one would be Diego Armando, just mm-hmm. because I'd probably sit there and uh, and no say a word because I think he's probably the only player that I would use the word hero worship. Because if you're mm-hmm. in a particular era, Diego Maradona is somebody that uh, I've never never witnessed anything like him before or since. And probably never will. Yeah, and, uh, I just um, I had the fortunate privilege and honour of meeting him and stuff and just things like that in your life are surreal. I'm just a wee guy for school pride and I had my picture taken with the through through my job. I was fortunate and uh, yeah, so it's he would be the guest of honour, as they say, because he just, he just is the man and the greatest of all time. In my own personal opinion, people might disagree with that, but I, I've written a book, as you so, and there's a chapter in the book where I explain why I think he's the best ever. So that's he'd be he'd be there, and the other one would be Johan Cruyff, mm-hmm. because Cruyff would be great in terms of conversation. 
Two of my favourite books are Ajax, Barcelona, Cruyff and My Turn. Uh, both by Cruyff. Or first one I about Barcelona, Cruyff is a series of interviews. Mm-hmm. By two Dutch journalists that Cruyff gave to them. And then My Turn's just Johan Cruyff, obviously. Uh, and he he's that incredibly gifted that he became part of the football lexicon with the Cruyff turn. And he yep. probably probably love that more than anything that he's because no other players got a, a move named after him to my knowledge. And just the way he thought about football in terms of space, time, meters and distance that you can run, it's it's otherworldly. But you can understand why the Dutch came up with the concept of total football. And it's mm-hmm. just so, so interesting. And I just think that he would tie you in knots talking about football, but it would be it would be great. It's and funny Mark, you say he's the only player to have a, a name moved after him. I'm pretty sure before he's moved to Celtic when he was at Dundee United, um, some pundits tried to give the Gary Mackay Stevens shuffle when he does the <laughs> keep you ups over the player. Um, but no, well, I don't think that one really stuck. He would be delighted with that company then, if he, but you know, but it's, <laughs> it's synonymous with football with the Cruyff turn. You don't call it yeah. anything else, you know. So, no. And I think uh, if that's if in terms of Great footballers. Uh, and my other one would be for the fun aspect would be George Best. Mm-hmm. I just uh, there's something about George Best that attracts you to him like a magnet. You know, it's I, I just think he's the, he's the greatest footballer this country's ever produced, bar none. It's indisputable, but you just can't understand why he quit so young. Well, you can, but you know, a, a sublime talent with a million and one stories both on and off the field, but I would just love to pick his brain actually about the football because we know all the off the field stuff, but I'd love to talk to him about because, again, he, he just, he looked like somebody who was a free spirit on a football park and he just did things that were just incredible. And one of my favourite goals is his wee dink over Pat Jennings, which mm-hmm. thing we did in it. Honestly, he makes it look so easy. And it's the most difficult skill in the world because there's a guy in a goal line as well. You know, and uh-huh. he just... And he just uh, and I think it's Barry Davis that's commentating and he says, beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And I, as, as, a, as a goal, it's just it's one of them that stuck in my mind and I wasn't even born when he scored it. So I, uh, I'd i love I'd love to just sit him down and talk to him about football, you know, something that he loved and something that he great pleasure doing. It's interesting, sorry, just before you give your last one, you said something there that I'm surprised hasn't started a a discussion yet in the comment section. You said he's the greatest footballer that this country's ever produced. So you would rate George Best over Jimmy Johnson? I would, I. Yeah, I do. Uh, Again, that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. I I, uh, I think a lot of Celtic supporters would maybe disagree with that, but I... uh, I, I do. I think George Best was was the man, yeah. I think he had everything. And uh yeah, I would I would argue the, the toss on that one with anyone really, yeah. But I, again, I think that would be a really interesting debate that one. Um uh, hearing uh, both sides. That's maybe one for another podcast. Yeah, but who's um, completing the who's completing uh, the table? Well my last one's not a player, it's a manager and it's in my father's eyes the greatest manager of all time and it's Jock Steen. And I would mm. love to just as a journalist, I one regret that I was I wasn't around at his time. I would love to have just sat there because I would have just have listened. I don't think I would have bothered them with banal questions. But once I, I learned something, as I got older, I might have asked them. I might have deemed myself worthy of asking them something. But it's just there is nothing he didn't know about football. Mm-hmm. And I saw something the other day. And it wasn't even Celtic related, but it was just a stroke of managerial genius. Alex, Sir Alex Ferguson took him to uh, Stockholm when Aberdeen played Real Madrid, the Cup Winners' mm-hmm. Cup final. And he just said he took him to, to inspire them. And, and before the game, seemingly Jockstein said to him, forget Real Madrid. You're not playing the name. You're not playing the history. You're playing 11 players. You can beat them, right? No, Aberdeen on paper against Real Madrid should have absolutely no chance. But mm-hmm. 
Sir Alex Ferguson said that when they heard that, the players walked out into the stadium like like that, you know. He just stripped them bare and stripped and said to them that and I think eventually he said, look, they've got three good players, <laughs> Stilica, <laughs> you know, Santaliana or something, and someone else, right? He said, and it, it just kind of, and you know what? I thought, well, how good would that have been to hear? You know, and then I saw another clip the other day about Jockstein talking about that he always drummed it into the Celtic players, how they could lose every game in the light of the Partick Thistle, 71 League Cup final defeat. Mm-hmm. And he said to them, it just it, you know, and he, and he spoke about it, and he, and I just thought, you know what? What an educate. I mean, just even sit there, and a, to, a, to a lesser extent, to a far lesser extent, I got that a wee bit when you dealt with Brendan Rodgers, because he was just such a learned guy, and you know, a real ambassador, and just a, a kind of a statesman-like figure. And Steen was the same. I, I, I I'd have loved to have just sat in and his pressers and just listened, you know, and, and learned a bit more about football. And I think he'd be a brilliant guest because I, I would want to know what he said to the guys before the European Cup final as well, you know, probably mm-hmm. the same thing. You can beat this mob, you know, but the, the way Celtic played in the European Cup final, you think to yourself, well, there's no real tactics for that. They've just went about and upset about them, you know, so... When did he decide that that's what Celtic were going to do? You know, that kind of thing. I, I'd love to just... Yeah. And, I, and other things as well. I, I, I just think that he's just a, 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 an enormous figure in Scottish football. You know, mm-hmm. and arguably the greatest manager that this country has produced. Uh, people might say it's Sir Alex, but I would say it's Jock because he was the one that won the European Cup for the first time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. with a team from that 30 mile radius and stuff and it's just a phenomenal achievement in sport it, it, it's arguably up there with the greatest achievement in any sport that you can mould yeah. and shape a team from guys from such a small area to become the kings of Europe you know and that that kind of stuff fascinates me and just he just he, he, he subtle nuances various things that he did to, and I don't think my dad would forgive me if I ever had a chance to <laughs> bring people back for a, a meal and he wasn't one of them, you know. <laughs> I, I, would so, even, I would even open the door so my, my dad could stand outside and they could hear them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so at the Haggerty household, there will be Diego Maradona, Johan Cruyff, George Best and Jock Steen. That sounds like a fantastic uh, dinner table. And I, I hope they'll eat their steaks well done because that's the way Anthony has them. <laughs> Uh, if you have got your own, um, let us know. Hugh Anthony Riley's done that. Saying McStay, Baggio, Xavi and Gershon. Um, Mr Max came in and says it would be toast on beans. Is it not beans on toast for five? Um, <laughs> Ursula Lynch came in here saying uh, Jock, just Jockstein, Puskas, Messi and Henrik. Uh, yeah. Again, masters of their craft. Uh, and John Boy came in and saying, did some work with Billy Campbell who roomed the best he was playing for Northern Ireland. Some of the stories he told me couldn't be repeated. Um, well, maybe it can offline, but maybe not on the <laughs> podcast. Um, so, yeah, that's a fantastic dinner party. If you are watching along, let us know who you would have. Um, and, Anthony, we can't let you go today without having a discussion about your career. You've already mentioned it a couple of times. 20 years working for the Daily Record, covering Scottish football throughout some of the, the greatest times in recent history. Teams making European finals. Um the, the kind of period of domination that Celtics had, but also some of the, the, the great lows of Scottish football as well, um, especially surrounding the national team under Betty Vox, yeah. um, the, the draw with the Faroe Islands. There's been a, a lot that's happened in your time that you were there. But, I mean, what was your um, what was your kind of pathway into becoming a journalist? What made you become um, a journalist? I, I did a university degree, English and Politics at Staff Clyde, and then I did a I went back and did a postgraduate in mm-hmm. journalism. And then, uh, when I left, I got a job with the Paisley Gazette covering St. Lydon. And I did that for a year. It was a weekly paper, but I called it the Paisley Gazette de la Sport because that's when they tell you <laughs> on the TV and stuff. So, uh, and it was brilliant. It was just, uh, you covered St. Lydon and then you covered the junior clubs, Atherley, uh, 
in the old and Johnson Borough ran through. But that was a brilliant ground, and that taught me everything, you know, how to deal with players, managers, you know. And then we, after that, I left after a year, and I, I went to a company called Scottish News and Sport, SNS. They deal with f- photos now, they do more photography. They used to yep. do words as well. And everything we did was for the Daily Record. Mm-hmm. So my boss at the time, Gordon Waddle, said to me, why don't you ask the record for a job? This was in 99. Mm-hmm. Everything you do is for the record. I said, okay. So I asked them. And they kind of said, yeah, we'll speak to you. So I go up to the other record towers. My hair's kind of still like this, but I've got, <laughs> I've got canary yellow highlights in it, right? So Jim Trainer didn't even speak to my face. He spoke to my hair. Just stood like that, looking towering above me and thinking, you know, you want to be a journalist, you know, take yourself more seriously type thing. You know? <laughs> so I got the vibe that he didn't like the hair. So I got the I got the colour cut out of it and I came in like kind of like this the next day. <coughs> and he said, better. And then he gave me a year's trial and a year's contract. And after the year, they, they made it a permanent deal. So I, uh, and that was me uh, for the next 20 years. I mean, it was just, it was fantastic, you know, and, you, as you say, you, you're you asked to write about your opinion on football every week. You know, highs, <laughs> highs, lows, whatever, you know. I've seen Hibs win the Scottish Cup. I wrote about Hibs winning the Scottish Cup. I mean, mm-hmm. that was 114 years. Who did it was shattered that day? You know, you, you just don't think. You know, you're there. But the enormity of it sinks in when you leave and you think, have you seen a massive... What is a massive moment in Scottish football history, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I was laughing that day because we were asked to predict the score. <coughs> Excuse me. I got it bang on. I said it would be 3 to Hibs. I said <laughs> it, as I said, it would be a repeat of the 1979 Cup final, which just the scoreline would be flipped. So I stuck money on it. And so at the end, I was sitting beside you and Graham, a fellow journalist. <coughs> We were in the overspill, so there was Rangers fans kind of leaving at the end. <coughs> and Ewan's like touching my knee and saying, you won your bet, you won your bet. <laughs> and I, calm down, there are people about to go absolutely mental here. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> maybe not the time or the place. So different moments like that, you know, and uh, I, for a pullout, I was asked, when Henry Larson left Celtic, for a pull-out, I was asked to describe 242 of his goals. Now, how do you describe 242 goals saying different things? But mm-hmm. I, I was asked to do it. So I did it. And uh, I was in the office one day, and Hugh Keevans was on the phone to Alan McCoyst. But his mobile phone went, he's on the landline, his mobile goes, I've picked it up. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Did you say Hugh Keevans had a mobile phone? I thought this was only just a new thing. I thought this was just a new thing for Shug. No, he had a mobile phone, but he used to conduct all his business on a landline. So (laughs) his mobile goes, and I pick it up, and I say, hello, it's Tony Haggerty, who's calling? And I just, I instantly recognise the voice, it's Henrik Larson. So I've just, I've gone tonto. I I don't care who you're talking to, Shug, he got off the phone, not knowing it was Alan McCoy. I said, it's Henrik Larson. And I said, Henry, it's Tony, I'm just trying to get Shug's attention, I'll get back to you. And for some inexplicable reason, he said, ah, you described all my goals when I left Celtic. He said, my son loved it. And I'm like, yeah. He said, it was a cracking souvenir, thank you. And I was like, thanks very much. You know, he just kind of... <laughs> so Shug hung up the phone on McCoy. And, uh, and I've handed him the mobile phone. And he's done, he, he did a bit, he'd arranged to do a bit with Henrik Larson because Henrik Larson never did much press when he was here. Mm-hmm. So he did that. So he's finished that. And then Shuggy's landline goes and then he picks it up. And then whoever it is on the end of the phone hung up on him. <laughs> and it was McCoy. And McCoy <laughs> and McCoy said to him, Henrik Larson, Henrik F. And Larson, you hung up the phone on me to Henrik F. And Larson. <laughs> And he says, how many golden boots has he got? <laughs> so years later, I'm at a function at Parkhead, or Celtic Park, sorry, and uh, 
I got to know Alan Stubbs really well when he was a manager at Hibs. So mm. he's sitting beside Henrik Larson at a table, and I knew Henrik Larson was going to be there. So I've got a copy of the pullout when I described the goals. And I've took a yeah. marker and I've, I've thought, I'll see if he'll sign that. So I've I've gone to Stubbsy and I've said, look, Stubbsy, go and do my favour. I said, go and introduce me to Henrik. I said, it's for a reason. I said, so he looks at the pullout and he's like, did you do this? I said, aye, that's all of these goals. So he's reading it, you know. So Alan Stubbs turns in and says, Henrik, well, he's a good friend of mine. He says, this is Tony Haggerty. She's, can you sign this for him? So Henrik's looking and says, oh, yes, yes. And I've said to him, Henrik, that, I wrote that. I said, I've unmasked myself as the author. And he's like, oh, so he's giving me a big hug. And he says, says, where do you want me to sign? And I, and I was like, anywhere. So he signs every page, right? And then he just starts going, yes, I remember that hat through good time castle. Yes. <laughs> he looks forward and says, ah, poor old Bert Conterman. <laughs> <laughs> so he starts he's just laughing, right? And then he starts, he starts, uh, he starts reading out the like, things that I've written about his goals, you know, the, the uh-huh. scripts of his goals. He starts reading a couple out. So I'm just standing there like that. Wow, this is just another surreal moment, you know. And I say to him, look, thanks very much. And he's like, no, thank you. He's like, she's out. And he's, re- and he's kind of like that. And he's kind of reluctant to give me a bag. You know what I mean? I was like, this is that. thanks a lot. And he just kind of, I was like, like thanks. I'll, I'll let you go now. And he's like, no, thank you. That's great. And, then, and as I walk away in the earshot, I can just hear, Bert Conterman in the two of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, wow, you know? So, I mean, things like that, you, you, you never ever think that your, uh, your career's going to... It introduces you to the great and the good, right? I mean, some not so good, you know? But I, as I say, I, I, I've written a book about that, and it's uh, 20 chapters of kind of the highlights of 20 years of working for the Daily Record, and... Hugh McDonald, the great writer for the Daily Mail, he he described it as my love letter to football, and it is because I always felt privileged doing what I did, and it charts my kind of journey from going to the football with my dad as a kid, and then working in football, and there's chapters on Maradona, George Best, Henrik Larson, Jim Baxter, and these are some of the people I never even met: Charlie Nicholas, you know, eh, David Cooper. You know, it's all just kind of football and with a family thread running through it. And, uh, yeah, I just, uh, I, you pinch yourself. You know, I, I was always grateful. I was always, I, I always conducted myself with a lot of humility because a lot of people wanted to do this job. I would have done anything to do it. And yeah. I always thought, you know what, be grounded, just stay true to yourself and, you know, enjoy it. and take it for what it is and it was a lot of the uh, experiences were surreal and they were brilliant it's only when I look back and I think wow when I put it to pr- print that I think oh wow you know it's uh, yeah. yeah and uh, and, uh, and there's a lot of humour in it as well there's a brilliant chapter with John Manby I'll no spoil it for people that maybe want to buy the book but he was just a force of nature you know and you can imagine John Manby in an after match presser talking you know, so uh, yeah, that was uh, ferocious, you know, but uh, and funny, just it's funny, you know. So I, I, uh, I, I, it was all in there. So during the first lockdown, I brought it down there, and uh, yeah, and and uh, people who have read it, football fans that have read it, have, have really enjoyed it and really liked it, and that's the most humbling tribute to me that they've got in touch to say, look, really like that. So yeah, well, yeah. thank you, you know, and. Yeah, and the book itself, it, it's called Goni Gies a Kick at Your Ball, Mister. Um, <laughs> it, it's something that you, you kind of hear when you're growing up in Scotland. And as you say, quite a few people already have it. We've got John McGackie Ford here just saying, uh, just got your book delivered today, Anthony. Looking forward to reading it. Um, God, cheers. A couple of other, couple <laughs> other comments coming in. Chris Fraser coming in saying, the Mr. Milk Tray, I love your stories. Totally brilliant. Um, uh, and Feed the Bear. <laughs> Feed the Bear wasn't impressed with the Swedish um, accent. He says, were you talking to the Terminator? <laughs> but um, did he didn't sound like a Bond villain in the end of a phone, you know what I mean? So, yeah, <laughs> I, I did kind of, I recognised it, you know, that way. I, I was more kind of shocked than anything else, you know. So, 
Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but no, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Um, before we, we, we wrap up, tell us, where is the book available? It's available on Amazon. You can get it in Kindle or paperback. Uh, called Go Nagisa Kick Your Bomb, Mister, and you can get it for five ninety nine. And if anyone would want to buy it, then I'd be really touched and humbled if you did that. Uh, and hope you enjoy it if you do. And uh, just a final comment coming in here from Stevie Doc saying, met you a few times, Tony, when I played at Thistle. Lambie was some man. Um, um, so great guy. For, Stevie to ca- for Stevie to catch up with you after the show, where are you on the socials? Uh, I'm on, you get me at ahaggerty10 on Twitter and just uh, and on Facebook. Just stand me Haggerty. I'm on Facebook as well. So, uh, yeah, at ahaggerty10. Uh, that's my, my Twitter handle. You'll get me on that. So, and usually if people uh, respond to me, I'll, I'll get back to them. Just a, I'll, I'm always kind of mindful of, you know, if somebody is kind then to, to take time out of their day to get in touch then. I'll, I'll get back to them, you know, so. Yeah, and it's been an absolute, absolute pleasure having you on today. Um, it's been a pleasure to be it's, on, very much. It's, uh, yeah, I enjoy it. You know, it's good fun. Just let people know. It's been some... Back. <laughs> there's been some really good stories and I know there's even more to come so hopefully um, later on in the series we'll have you back to discuss um, some more we'll see how the book's been doing um, if you are watching now give us a like subscribe um, coming up at 12.30 we'll have the Celtic State of Mind Bulletin um, and if you're looking to catch up on this it'll be on YouTube afterwards it's also coming out in audio format on the Celtic State of Mind stream that comes out roughly at the weekend so you can catch up and listen to Anthony once again Next week, I will be joined by Sky Sports' Anthony Joseph, um, and I'm very much looking forward to, to chatting to him as well. So if you've got any questions in advance, um, reach out to me on Twitter. I'm at Colin88Watt, um, or uh, get in touch through the other channels. But, Anthony, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. It's been a pleasure reading all the comments coming in today from uh, the contributors as well. But until next week, stay safe, and um, we'll see you then. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Cheers.